As we reached the Gulf Stream, the winds increased and kicked up the sea. James' 28-foot boat, Atom, moves aggressively under the press of sails, and her motion is lively, too lively for me to adjust to so quickly. Seasickness sent me to my bunk. It seems I did not fully realize the severity of this roller coaster ride. My naive expectations of how I wanted it to be unraveled my belief in my sailing plans. It seems that reading books on sailing is not one bit as informative as one day actually under sail. I also saw that James was a man of great endurance and able to subject himself to the extended discipline and sacrifice of comfort on a small boat at sea. My pitiful state made me wonder if I could, or if I even wanted, to do the same. Sleep last night? Not much. Had to keep jumping up to uh, reef sails or the whisker pole came loose, started banging around, had to deal with that at 3 o'clock. And a bolt vibrated loose in the wind vane, lost steering, so rushed out to take care of that. Everything's back in order now, but not much sleep last night. Getting used to the rough seas slamming the boat around. And I've got the windward bunk on this trip, so 
when you're alone, you can shift from the windward side to the leeward side, get a little more comfort. Mm. Ready for another? The care and feeding of the offshore crew. We're hand feeding our film crew this morning after a rough night. Crackers and cheese. I want to give a shout out to my sponsors. I want to big, throw out a big thanks to Huggies and Depends. <laughs> Get me through this. <laughs> yeah, you've had a bit of a rough uh, inauguration here at sea. I want to say one love to, pa to, to Pampers for getting me through the, the saga. <laughs> Keeping things right. You spent a lot of time in your bunk. When I, was I, have down low. To, I have to admit that a lot of time in your bunk with uh, the bucket tethered close by. I just want to shout out. <laughs> I want to say big thanks to my my supporters, Rubbermaid. You know, the sea is a challenging environment and I've had friends that have left on passages and never returned. Lost at sea happens occasionally. When I was in South Africa on my first circumnavigation, I had a sailing friend who was anchored next to me there and he had built his own 50-foot ferro cement sailboat and had sailed it more than halfway around the world. He was in South Africa and he got a local girl as crew and she wanted to emigrate to Australia so he said he would take her and they set off from Durban on the Indian Ocean coast of South Africa uh, for that high latitude stormy passage to Australia and at the time we both had SSB transceiver radios on board so we kept in touch every day with the radio schedule and all went well for about 10 days as he got further out into the South Indian Ocean oh in the 45 degrees south latitude stormy area and he was at least a thousand 1500 miles out into the ocean and on one of our daily radio chats he said we're in a huge storm out here the biggest one I've ever seen and it's very difficult to manage the boat in the weather and so well he he was competent sailor and had a big boat and we kind of expected he'd be all right the next day on our radio schedule, silence. The next day again, silence. Never heard from him again. And I was relaying his messages back to his father, who was also on uh, amateur radio back in Florida, because he wasn't getting a good signal from the boat. And so I had to tell him that uh, I'd lost contact with him. And so his father, you know, you know what should we do? But you can't just start a search in the middle of the entire ocean somewhere. So all I could say was, well, let's hope that maybe the boat was partially disabled and they're able to jury-rig the boat and make it into port eventually somewhere and you'll hear from him. I said you can alert the authorities in the various uh, countries around the area, but so I told his father, if you don't hear from him in a month or two, then they probably went down in that storm. Maybe a rogue wave turned him over, broke the boat open, and sank. It's hard to know what happened, but they disappeared at sea, and that was sad. Back in 1987, as James sails across the Pacific, some 3,400 empty miles nonstop from his Hawaiian departure, Atom's keel floats above the deepest waters on Earth. 
the Mariana Trench. Deeper by far than Mount Everest is tall. In this lonely part of the Western Pacific, he makes landfall at Saipan Island in the Northern Marianas Island Group. As on other islands before, James goes ashore with his backpack to walk across the island, finding this tropical island filled with the scars and ghosts of a titanic struggle between U.S. forces against Japan's Empire of the Sun in World War II. He sleeps in a bombed out cave that had been a Japanese command post and looks out over the infamous Bonsai Cliffs where hundreds of civilian men, women and children leapt to their deaths rather than surrender honoring the fatalistic Bushido Code where conquered people were considered unworthy of life even if they were the conquered people themselves. Very angry surf rolling up underneath Banzai Cliff. There's the memorial, Japanese memorial. And just beyond this field is Banzai Cliff, where the civilian Japanese lined up, the father lined up this, his family, youngest child first, then older children, then his wife, and then himself, and they jumped off. The history of mankind is filled with triumph and tragedy, reflecting on the rewards and intrinsic dangers of solo sailing around the world to fulfill the need to explore James' rights. Sailors relish the challenges and adventures of travel through the vastness of oceans. Directed solely by the great circulation of winds and our own desires, a well-planned voyage will contain some blissful days of warm winds at your back and an open pathway ahead. But it is not always that easy. There is also the strain of sleepless nights during bad weather in reef-studded waters, the physical toll of bouncing through the rough seas, and always the chance of mishap, even death on the indifferent sea. That is the yin and yang of voyaging, a fine balance with all its varied elements in coexistence. Don't worry about those rogue waves like the ones that uh, almost sank my friend Henry and, and probably did sink uh, my other friend who was lost in the Indian Ocean on his boat. But a rogue wave is a pretty rare event and they come in different sizes. You know, the average sea, like today, is running six foot seas. Every now and then, every thousand or five thousandth wave coincides with another wave train and you'll get maybe 12 foot sea on a day like today which can really surprise you but you can imagine if you're in a storm and you've got 20 foot seas running and you have the misfortune to encounter a rogue wave in that event well that could turn your boat upside down or pitch pull you end over end, sink you outright, lose your mast, anything could happen. But it's very rare, especially if you use good passage planning. And I never encountered anything like that on all my trips. 
nothing really threatening beyond uh, a 20 foot minor rogue wave that broke the tiller, turned the boat sideways onto the waves and dipped the leeward scrutter in the sea. Um, so here's where we're approaching the little Bahama bank to try and go in and anchor off Grand Key. But the winds had forecast to be moderate from the east to the southeast by the time we got here, which would make that accessible. But now we're only 25 miles away and the wind is blowing strong from the northeast. So we may not be able to enter the bank here. It might be too dangerous, in which case the wind doesn't lighten up and shift by morning. We'll have to abandon it and sail on out and go to a port in Florida. So you got to be flexible in your plans, work with the wind you got. 25 miles away from Grand Key, our destination Anchorage, James studies his maps and checks the forecasted conditions. From his observations, he is concerned and expresses doubt for our safe arrival attempt. His protocol, long developed from years of voyaging, is an ingrained belief of conservative judgment, learned by his appreciation for the sea's beauty, in balance with the respect of her awesome power. An excerpt detailing his personal connection is as follows. I kept returning to the sea because I was still in love with her. I longed for the outlandishly painted sunsets and silvery moonrises over open horizons. The blissful calms and terrifying tempests to dance with the waves under a big sky, the joyous arrivals and even the sad goodbyes. I loved the sea, despite her unforgiving tendency to punish the unprepared 